in the working environment at the moment where we're all working on our own in isolation in zoom doom as what we call it um we are working in a sanitized environment that is so quiet it's super quiet right and that can become lonely that can become isolating and that can become problematic even whether you're a student or not right that's for anybody the, the world is having these issues at the moment right and that's another reason why it's really important that you guys unmute um because we thrive on human interaction right and we thrive on chatting and listen if a phone goes off okay if if you cough sneeze as long as you do appropriate respiratory etiquette and catch it bin it kill it don't worry about it okay because i understand that life happens and things happen right so so that's that so uh welcome to Hull york medical school and what i honestly believe is the greatest profession in the world okay you are incredibly lucky and privileged um to embark on a journey uh to become a doctor okay it is the greatest job in the world i always wanted to be a doctor i never thought i could be or would be and every year at medical school my concern was i was just going to get kicked out of medical school and that was because going through i was struggling with undiagnosed dyslexia and as we talk more on other modules, uh, as we come together again, I'm happy to discuss about learning styles and techniques and things things that I did to help me, right? But I didn't prepare that for this talk. Um, so I'm Kishan, uh, great to meet you. I'm an honorary lecturer with, with Hull York Medical School. I'm also a student as well. Uh, so I'm a, uh, an MD student uh, and I'm writing a MD on the role of media uh, in the use, or oh, sorry, the use and the role of media in the middle of a global pandemic. So, I mean, it'll be topical if nothing else. Um, so, I am in the same boat as you guys. You guys are all starting as students, and I'm not starting the MD. I'm well, I might as well. I'm not going to lie, right? I've still got, I've got to write sixty thousand words, and I've written about four thousand. So, I think I probably am starting. Um, but I officially signed up to it a while ago. Um, I also work in medical affairs. Uh, for a pharmaceutical company called AstraZeneca. Um, and in the future, if you'd like talks about what medical affairs is, I'm happy to do that. And I also work uh, occasionally clinically, just keeping my hand in as an urgent care doctor at a hospital in London. So in terms of a disclaimer, one thing that I need to let you guys know is, um, and this is, I'm incredibly grateful to my employers, um, all of them for letting me come out and talk and speak. Um, but what you guys need to know is that I am not um, representing their views. It is just my own views. Um, and I've just been told I have to put that in all my talks. So so that bit's that done. Um, I thought it would be good to kind of get to know me a little bit. Um, so I've told you the work stuff. You know a lot about my cat. Um, and I wanted to share with you about my love of cycling. Have we got any cyclists in the in the audience? Um, you can just put in the chat in terms of the comments, either like yes, no, or hate it, can't stand it, whatever. Um, so yeah, so I love cycling. And cycling is something that I took on in, in March in, big, um, in a big degree um, because I was undertaking something called biohacking. Does anybody know what biohacking is? Don't worry, you're not going to get examined on it. It's not in the syllabus. And you're not um, expected to know about it. This is just more of interest as to whether any of you, any of you have read around it. Modifying the body with tech. Yeah, brilliant. That's one way of doing it. That's a great. Uh, yes, it is. Um, it's it's also. I meant bike to. I biked to the bike shop today, but only because I can't see the rest of your thing. I'm really sorry. Installing parts. Okay, fair enough. You guys can chat as well if you want to. You you can text equally as well. I don't mind. Uh, like crypto readers in your hands and stuff. Um, I'm not sure what that is. We might have to pick up with that later. I tried, uh, I had a little dabble with cryptocurrency a couple of years ago and I won't be putting any more money into it because uh, I bought at the peak and I got texts from my friends. I didn't buy a lot, but I got texts from my friends when I was on an A&E shift saying, oh my God, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm just working. They're like, have you moved your crypto out of your thing? I was like, no, because I've forgotten about it. I don't even have access to the thing. And they're like, oh, we just wanted to check on you because the market's tanked. So we wanted to make sure that you weren't suicidal. Um, so that was a true story. Um, 
But anyway, biohacking is essentially, yes, modifying your body with tech, but it is also exploiting one's own physiology and biology to get the ultimate physical performance, right? Um, so my biohacking journey started in uh, March when I knew what was coming in terms of lockdown. Um, this sounds really sci-fi. Um, yeah, maybe a little bit. Uh <laughs> So when I started, when I started looking into this in kind of February, March time, and I'd heard a little bit about it before, I could see partly because of my dyslexic mind putting different things together, whether it be from the media, whether it be from the pharmaceutical industry, whether it be from clinical medicine, that this was going to be a big thing. OK, this was going to be uh, something that's significant. So I decided I wanted to try and get fit and lose weight. So I started cycling every day, once a day. Um, and the pinnacle of this, my personal best, was on Friday, the 11th of September, just gone, where over eight and a half hours, I covered 145.07 kilometres, right? Towards the end of this journey, um, because I took a train back, I don't know if you can see my pointer, possibly, possibly not, but um, towards the end of the journey, it was actually quite difficult, right? And I was literally uh, falling asleep at the wheel, so to speak, only my cycle wheel, you'll be pleased to know. Um so that was the route. Um, it was a lovely sunny day uh, on the Monday, the 14th of September. So uh, any suggestions in terms of what you think I did? <coughs> Obviously, I invested in this and booked a day of annual leave and went out. Now, loads of my mates, well, not loads of my mates, one of my mates, Hardeep, who's a plastic surgery registrar in australia now he's gone out there um rips it into me saying that i bought a female saddle now i i've spoken to you quite a lot today already about cats and cycling and i'm well aware that you are not really uh kind of here for that so i thought i better make this talk slightly medical does anybody know we are here for that? What, the cats or the medical? Uh, <laughs> hopefully it's a bit of both because I did bring the the stress cystitis into the cat, right? Not not literally. That was a bit of barbed wire and it sliced itself open. And I'll never forget the day. I came home uh, from a Watford match early because they were losing, which is a rep repetitive thing. You can see me trudging out of Vicarage Road. Um, and I could smell blood on my cat. And I said to my mum, can you smell blood like the smell of flesh? Uh, almost like when I was doing surgical training. And she was like, no. And then I saw Carl limping in, right? So I put him on my bed and like examined him because obviously that's what you do. Um, well, that's what I do. Probably normal people probably wouldn't do that. But anyway, so I examined him and he had a flesh wound and he was like seared. And the, the vet said he was literally millimetres away from going through his femoral, femoral artery and exsanguinating. So exsanguinating is when you bleed out, basically. Uh, so he was really, really lucky. And we took him to pets at home and they fixed him and they did operate on him. They did the surgery on him. And he um, basically was after that, he was suffering from stress cystitis. Um, but anyway, so what, what you've had a time to think while I've been talking about other stuff and my cat. Does anybody know the medical link in terms of why a man might want to have a cycle seat like this or have i just got a woman's cycle seat which could equally be possible any ideas and you know what if there's no ideas just you can say no or just just say no no or whatever or or not it's fine um okay so uh, anything to do with different size pelvises more comfy here we go very good more comfortable i can tell you, i promise you it's more comfortable 100 percent. different size pelvises is a, it looks nice <laughs> different size pelvises is a very good comment in terms of a difference between the male and female anatomy not to do it the coccyx but it's close to that so that's a good good suggestion keep thinking what else from an anatomical point of view i'll give you a clue from a soft tissues point of view is in that area if you were to sit down. Oh, is it the extra cushioning or something? It, uh, yes, it is extra cushioning to a certain extent. Um, because vagina, yes, glutes, mm, bit bigger, but it's there as well. But uh, <laughs> yeah. but but from my yeah. from my anatomy <laughs> point of view, um, I, maybe I should have specified <laughs> from my anatomy point of view, um, what is there? 
Uh, so, so it is more comfy. But why is it more comfy? And it's more comfortable on the soft tissues. <laughs> 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 what, what, it, it is more comfortable on soft tissue so I'm going to take that gap it is that gap yes here that gap yes oh as in you're saying it looks like that yeah for, yeah, quite right so it is basically hold on I'm going to go to this so the soft yeah, tissues in go. terms of in terms of the male anatomy right the male anatomy is I knew it yeah okay good so so the common thing that some cyclists can get if you have repetitive injury and bearing in mind remember guys right I've taken a day of annual leave on Monday I've just done 145 kilometers over eight eight hours right and then I was going to do another 140 kilometers on the following day on the Monday right crazy loads of people are saying i should rest take it easy forget about it but i went out and bought a cycle seat to allow a certain part of my anatomy which is basically the base of the prostate and around here so that it is more comfortable because if you cycle for a long time and uh, professor tony young who's a urological surgeon and he's also the national clinical lead of innovation at nhs england he he told me, you do know this is a problem, right? I was like, oh, my God, I have no idea. So I rushed out and, and bought this. Um, the problem is, is some of the nerves in that area can get compressed. So you can get erectile dysfunction. Uh, well, close, yeah, but it, it's more erectile dysfunction because the nerves that are responsible for uh, getting and maintaining an erection can get something that's called neuropraxia. Now, I'm not going to go into that. Um, because it's obviously um, way beyond the scope of this. But there is an important principle. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm glad. Am I saying that properly? Um, I'm glad that you agree. But there is a really important anatomical principle, right? <laughs> there is a really important anatomical principle on this. And that is you always need two views. OK, so in from an anatomy point of view, I could put this right here, one picture on the left, and leave it like that. But that is useless. How does that help you? So from an anatomy point of view, you always need an AP, which is a frontal view, and a lateral, which is a side view. Really, really important, right? And you can always remember that by looking at- Because it's to do with the crown jewels. Sorry. Uh, no, very good link. Who said that? I don't know who said that, but that's a <laughs> I didn't think about the crown jewels, but that is a brilliant uh, tangential link. The crown nice jewels really indeed. Good. So, so if you can always think of the Duke of Cambridge giving somebody the finger, if you just look at this one, right, that would be, I, unfortunately, I didn't put the pictures the right way around, right? So the one where on the side and it looks like he's giving someone the finger, that is a lateral and that is one that, that's on the top left of your screen. And the other one is the AP. So I need to change that around as well. So, so I will do that and I will also credit you as well if you want, but maybe you don't want to be credited for that. I don't know. It's up to you. Yeah, I, I don't want to be remembered for this. <laughs> okay, fine. That, that is fair enough and that's, um, that's, that's good. I want something meaningful for heritage. Yeah, it's not the kind of thing to be remembered for, is it, from a medical career? Um, I've got to just take the wins as they come, right? So I'm quite happy to be remembered by that. But, um, but the, the serious point about this is when I was at medical school, and it was only 16 years ago. It probably sounds like an absolute eon ago. But it was 2004 and I was 18. I was at medical school. So in your situation then. So I'm a millennial. You guys are Generation Z. We're not a million miles apart. But when I was at med school, I struggled so much with these flat 2D representations of 3D anatomical structures. And that's why ultimately I kept on failing all my surgical exams in addition to the dyslexia. So I really wish... I really, really wish that I had the, the anatomical apps that are available to you now. Now, there are loads of free ones available. There's images available online. What I'm suggesting you do is don't rush out and buy an anatomy, an, yeah, an anatomy textbook um, without checking out these models, right? Because then I found this online earlier, this 3D representation, right? And then what I did was I got this. OK, and I started labelling this. Now, the last time I looked at this anatomy was a long time ago. And I'm not going to lie to you. Initially, I labelled it wrong. And I'm not going to go into the bits that I labelled wrong because the last time I looked at this was 16 years ago. But it, it, it serves a point, right, in terms of from an educational and from a learning style to test yourself 
and to test yourself and check that you get it right or wrong is really good. And that's why I left this one here in terms of this is the one that I use to check myself to make sure that I got it right and I was teaching you guys the right thing, okay? So um, there's also NHS website is a really, really good website to go to. Um, and the this link... time you're going to have to stop cycling. Wow, well, yeah. wow, well, wow. Well, interesting. Okay, so this brings oh, in, this, this, this comes into Paul's point, right, in terms of critical appraisal of stuff. So it's really important that you actually click on the link and look at it. And I'm not going to do it because it will mess up the, the presentation. But it's in the slides and look at it. And next time I chat to you, we will pick up on stuff in this in this lecture. Um, and I will, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about stuff. And we'll, so I would suggest you go and look at this um, and um, we can talk about the, the critical appraisal. So that is more than enough of medicine. And I want to get back to cycling, right? So I went to Hastings. I went to Rye. Um, I took a nice photo of a castle. This is the guy that I went cycling with. Uh, this is, he is called Tim. Um, he's a lovely bloke. This is us enjoying our socially distanced lunch. Um, this is my bike, in case you want to know about my bike. And there's some branch chain amino acids in there and some water and some other stuff. And um, Tim is clearly an ectomorph body shape. Um, really, really fit. Super, super fit. Way um, older than me, but also way fitter than me. But also... Um, I'm very grateful that I was on the ride with him. Um, and that's because you never know what the last photo is that you're going to take, right? And this was the last photo that I took three weeks ago today. Because uh, at 131 kilometres, I came off my bike. And this is only three weeks ago today. And the reason that I'm stuttering on some words and stuff is because I have suffered a traumatic brain injury with a couple of small, um, very small bleeds, but still, you know, significant. And I'll talk to you about that in a sec, in a minute. Um, but so if you ever want to see the look of fear in a patient's face or eyes, look at my eyes in the first and second photos, because I can assure you I was petrified and I know what they were doing, right? Because I used to work in a and &E. I used to do all this sort of stuff, right? Day in, day out. So uh, that's worth considering moving forward that you might do a blood test or a catheter or a cannula a million times, right? But always remember that it is the first time for that patient and you need to communicate it accordingly. It's absolutely critical. Um, so there's a bit of road rash. Um, this is um, some ECG um uh stickers we, we can talk through this in another talk like all this sort of stuff because at the end i've asked you to do some stuff and look at it and think about it um so i'm not going to detail this now because i want to leave some time for like chat and questions with you um but then so once i got over the shock i started thinking right i need to work out what's going on so i, I turned the camera around that i had and took a photo off the the machine behind me and also in front of me because I'm lying on the board and I don't know what's happening. I can't move. I can't um, talk to anybody. I don't know what the hell's going on. And I'm concerned at that potentially in the sense that I'm quite fit. So my resting heart rate should be a lot lower than 95, even though it's not over 100. So over 100 is known as tachycardia. There's also no SATs recording on this, but that's the level of oxygen in your blood. And that's something that's incredibly topical for COVID-19 because um, COVID-19 patients get happy hypoxia, essentially, where they can drop their SATs to levels that we never thought possible, 70% maybe, and be completely asymptomatic. And then finally, my blood pressure is 113 over 76, which is possibly a little bit low, I, I would suggest. So um, I decided to try and get another photo because I did think I had SATs because I was breathing and I had cognitive function and I knew what I was doing. And I also had the sense to check that the SATs probe that was on my finger and I swapped it around because I'd been lying on a pavement uh, in my boxer shorts when the HEMS, uh, that's Helicopter Emergency Medicine crew, that I'm incredibly grateful for um, when I was in a state not particularly well on the pavement they had cut me uh, in terms of all my clothes uh, down to my boxer shorts. Um, so the, the said Watford shirt will never be seen again, thankfully for some people. 
um, but my hands were freezing, right? So you put a pulse oximeter on your finger, which measures, measures the level of oxygen in your blood. It, my hand was really cold, so I just warmed up my hands and I put the pulse ox on and I got sats of 99, so that's good. Um, and a pulse rate that was about the same and a respiratory rate that was quite high, 21, right? So looking at this, yeah. at this point, I'm potentially in trouble, I think. So I asked the nurse, could I please have some IV fluids? They probably thought I was an idiot. Oh God, here we go. I also said, could I get some analgesia? And I also started breathing. Um, at this point, I didn't have any pain in my chest and I didn't know that I had rib fractures um, because once I left hospital and I stopped having the IV analgesia, breathing and coughing and sleeping was incredibly painful. So my sleep was really, really disturbed, right? So at this point, I've had some fluids. The pain control has got a bit better. Look what's happened to my pulse and my blood pressure. My pulse has come down and my blood pressure has gone up. And that's a positive thing in trauma, generally. OK, and we can talk about that more in more sessions as it's appropriate to your curriculum. So the next thing that they say to me is they say they wanted to do a trauma scan. And I was like, OK, do I really need to do a trauma scan? And I was trying to talk myself out of it because I felt my obs were going better. I'd semi-examined myself and taken some photos and I thought I was OK. Um, and they said, no, we need to do it. You might have distracting injuries. And they were completely right. Fair enough. Uh, distracting injury is basically when you have like a hole in the side of your head and a very big injury, you might miss other little injuries like rib fractures, like other kind of uh, problems, right? So I googled on my phone, what is the lifetime risk of a CT trauma scan? And I accepted it was uh, one in 15,000 lifetime risks. So I was like, okay, fair enough. I might as well just go ahead and do it. And then at this point, right, and this is my last proper slide in this story, because I had advanced copy of this report by chatting to an amazing nurse who I don't even know her name because I can't remember. She did introduce herself. But what I remember is she said that she was a stroke nurse in the past. This was straight after the CT happened. She looked at the scan, waiting for the report. The report wasn't even there. And she came back to me and she let me know. And she said, Kish, uh, yeah, um, there's, uh, there's, it's fine. Generally, there's no big problems. There's a couple of tiny, tiny bleeds. You are a, um, sorry, she said, I used to be a stroke physician. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, stroke nurse. You're in good hands. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. Right. So I thought, great, relaxed. Um, so, so this is a really important point in terms of the communication. As doctors, when we order these tests, we're very bad sometimes at communicating the result to the patient. And what this brings me on to, which is my final set of slides, which is something called the physician's pledge. Has anyone heard of this? I just want you all to say yes or no in the comments. This is not optional. This is absolutely essential. If you say no, it doesn't matter. No, that's fine. No, no. OK, fine. Don't worry. Don't worry. Keep going. Brilliant. Loads of people saying no. So have anyone heard of the Hippo uh, sorry, Hippocratic Oath? Yes. Yeah. OK, cool. Yeah. So, OK, Definitely. so so the Hippocratic Oath and Hippocrates is we will talk about um, because that's essential. Um, but the physician's pledge is kind of like a modern day equivalent of that, right? And I thought on your first day, is it your first day today, right? It's one of the first. One of the first. Yeah, first, well, first proper day. First proper day. Okay, cool. So, so I wish on my first day that I got a talk where I could see where my skills were going to be applied and deployed from a clinical perspective, but also what I would be expected to sign up to once I graduated, right? So the physician's pledge is this, and it is as a member of the medical profession, I solemnly pledge to dedicate my life to the service of humanity. The health and well-being of my patient will be my first consideration. I will respect the autonomy and dignity of my patient. I will maintain the utmost respect for human life. I will not permit considerations of age, disease or disability, creed, ethnic origin, gender, nationality, political affiliation, race, sexual orientation, social standing, uh, colour, Sarah, or any other factor to intervene between my duty and my patient. I will respect the secrets that are confided in me even after the patient has died. I will practice my profession with conscience and dignity and accordance with the good medical practice. I will foster the 
noble, sorry, I'll foster the honour and noble traditions of the medical profession. I will give my teachers, colleagues and students the respect and gratitude that is their due. I will share my medical knowledge for the benefit of the patient and the advancement of healthcare. I will attend to my own health, well-being and abilities in order to provide care of the highest standard. I will not use my medical knowledge to violate human rights and civil liberties, even under threat. I make these promises solemnly, freely and upon my honour. And I tell you what, guys, if that doesn't make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, because it still does for me, then you need to wonder why it doesn't, because I would suggest it should. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate your time. It's great to meet you all. Um, next steps and moving forward. Sorry, this is the corporate person in me that we, you can't end a slideshow without or a presentation without next steps and moving forward. I would suggest you guys look at anatomy, 3D anatomy apps and see which one you want to get. Think about what is advanced trauma life support. And if you'd like me to come and give a talk about that, I'm happy to. Uh, you might also want to look at and think about the anatomy, physiology of the bladder, prostate, that kind of area. Uh, probably stress cystitis is not, certainly of cats, is not the highest list of your priorities. So one, two and three, I would suggest is quite important. And I've only had a chance to speak to and interact with a few of you today. Um, I will pop up and uh, be regularly with you guys. Cats are always high on your priorities. Fair enough. Oh, and yeah, fair enough. Uh, so look at stress cystitis as well. And if you want to come back and do a presentation about stress cystitis in cats, you're more than welcome. Um, my email address, my HIMS email address is that. Um, I'm really accessible um, So to you guys. I'm seeing you guys as a cohort. I'm seeing you guys as a group. I'd like to work with you closely over this year and help you all both as individuals and collectively. So if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, you can. If you want to connect with me on Twitter, you can. But perhaps more importantly, if you want to WhatsApp me, this is my personal phone number. And so as long as you guys don't give it to anyone else, I'd really appreciate it because I can't handle like 200 or 400, however many people in the year's requests are. But you guys are a special group because you're the only group that I'm teaching. And there's only 32 of you, so it's completely manageable. So I'd like you all to save my number and um, you've obviously got Paul as the module lead and emails and all that sort of stuff. But all I would say is if you want to send me a stupid cat photo or you want to ask a question about anything, there's no such thing as a silly question. Even if you're in a lecture, you can take a photo of a slide and say, Kish, what do you think of this? And I promise you, if you WhatsApp me, I'll get back to you straight away. Um, if you email me, my HIMS account is better than my work account because I've got 10,000 unread emails there. Um, but um, WhatsApp is a good way to get me. Um, so thank you very much for listening. And if you've got any Q&A, I would welcome your questions and comments.